Welcome to Cinematic Excrement. Today we resume our examination of the winners of the Razzie for Worst Picture as we journey into the year 1985. And some interesting things happened that year. The comic strip Calvin and Hobbes debuted in newspapers. The Nintendo Entertainment System was released in North America. Michael Jordan was named the NBA's Rookie of the Year. And yes, basketball shorts used to look like that. The Coca-Cola Company released New Coke, which went over like a fart in church. And the top grocer at the box office was my favorite movie of all time, Back to the Future. And the Razzies still found plenty of fodder for their farcical award ceremony. But before we get into that, let's back up a few years. Back in 1982, the movie-going public were treated to a film about a Vietnam veteran, the last survivor of an elite Special Forces squad, recently returned to the United States and suffering from some serious PTSD. When he's harassed by the local cops for the crime of wanting to eat at a local restaurant, how dare he, he flips the fuck out and goes on a rampage. And as he quickly puts his military survival skills to use and tears this small town a new one, the sheriff and his deputies soon realize they just might have fucked with the wrong guy. That movie, starring Sylvester Stallone as John Rambo, was called First Blood. And it was awesome. Outside of the Rocky franchise, this is Stallone at his finest. He does a great job playing the physically and mentally battle-scarred Rambo. Richard Crenna delivered a great performance as Rambo's former CEO, Colonel Troutman, and Brian Dennehy was the perfect foil for Rambo as Sheriff Teasel. And the action and stunt work is intense. The interesting thing is, despite this movie's level of violence, it has a remarkably low body count. Only four people died, and technically Rambo didn't kill any of them. Although I suppose you could argue he killed Galt, albeit by accident, but Galt was an asshole, so who cares? And of course, it all ends with Rambo's impassioned speech about the horrors he experienced in Vietnam and the struggle to readjust to public life after the war, no doubt echoing the thoughts of real veterans. Back there I could fly a gunship. I could drive a tank. I was in charge of million dollar equipment. Back here I can't even hold a job. Fucking guys! Ah! And it all ends with this once great soldier, the last of an elite group, completely broken. How often do you see an action movie end with the hero bawling like a baby? And here, it totally works! It's not a perfect film by any means. It does have a few silly moments, like Rambo escaping the deputies by jumping off a goddamn cliff and coming away with only a minor cut. Ironically, Stallone himself was injured far worse doing that stunt than his character, which made it easy for him to act like he was in intense pain. He was. But overall, it's great and an action classic. Highly recommended. And it was a huge hit, which led to the inevitable sequel. Did it live up to its predecessor? Would I be talking about it if it did? Right off the bat, Rambo First Blood Part 2 takes the premise of the first movie and flushes it down the toilet. It opens with John Rambo in prison due to his rampage in the last movie, but he's not there for long as Colonel Troutman has an offer for him. He wants to send Rambo back to Vietnam on a recon mission to look for MIA troops that may still be alive and held prisoner by the Viet Cong. So they want to take a man who is obviously suffering from some serious PTSD due to what happened to him in Vietnam, and send him back to Vietnam. Well, I don't see any possible way this could backfire. It seems to me the people who made part two really didn't get part one, which is odd considering, like part one, Stallone himself has a writing credit. Also like part one, he didn't write the whole screenplay. He basically modified a draft already written by James Cameron of all people, but still, one would think that the guy who played Rambo would understand the character better than anyone. But First Blood Part 2 gives not one fuck about the mental anguish Rambo suffered by fighting in Vietnam and being tortured as a prisoner of war and watching his friend literally get blown in half by a booby trap. All it cares about is being a big, loud, dumb action movie, and by God, it succeeds. We got guns and explosions aplenty here. Hell, literally the first shot of the movie is an explosion. Subtlety we hardly knew ye. And it's not like part one wasn't violent, it absolutely was. But the violence had a point, showing how a human being can be turned into a highly trained killing machine and the toll it takes on the body and the mind. It was often bloody, but it never felt gratuitous. In part two, you better believe it's gratuitous. It's gratuitous as shit. And Rambo's body count this time around is ridiculous. And unlike part one, none of these deaths are accidental. 
It's a little known fact that screaming while you shoot makes the bullets fly faster. Hell, there is a moment where Rambo kills a VC, just one mind you, with an exploding arrow. Why would you use an exploding arrow to kill just one guy? Well, obviously the answer is, why wouldn't you use an exploding arrow to kill just one guy? And that's only a taste of the silliness in these action sequences. Early on, Rambo decides to use a bow in place of a gun for a very good reason. No sound. And that makes sense. His mission requires stealth, and gunshots are not exactly stealthy. However, <laughs> if the bow is supposed to produce no sound, why does it always make pew-pew noises whenever he shoots it? This is ridiculous. What's even more ridiculous is this movie was somehow nominated for an Oscar for Best Sound Effects Editing. It lost to Back to the Future, but still, the fact that it even got a nomination in the first place just boggles the mind. Of course, this was also the year Out of Africa somehow won Best Picture. It was the 80s, man. It was a weird time. Anyway, upon his release from prison, Rambo is taken to Vietnam where he meets the man running this operation, Major Murdoch, played by Charles Napier. And it's pretty clear right off the bat that Major Murdoch is a major asshole. And credit where it's due, Napier plays the part very well. The man was good at playing assholes. Much to Rambo's surprise, if he finds any POWs, he is not to rescue them. He is only to take pictures, and Troutman's squad will pick them up later. Why would anyone hire a one-man wrecking crew like Rambo just to take pictures? Did y'all see the first movie? Murdoch and Troutman also assure our hero that he will be backed up by the best in modern technology, which will practically do his job for him. But Rambo seems... nonplussed. We have the most advanced weapons in the world available to us. I always believe that the mind is the best weapon. I'm really not sure why Rambo would be against using such equipment. Wasn't a big part of his speech at the end of the first movie about how he used to be in charge of such equipment, and now that he's back home he has nothing? I was in charge of million dollar equipment! Well, what the hell do you think all this is, Johnny? It ain't a Commodore 64, I can tell you that. But none of this really matters as this highly trained soldier gets stuck while trying to jump out of the plane into enemy territory and has to cut his fancy equipment loose. So he's on his own. Well, I'm glad we took the time to establish this man versus technology theme and then promptly abandoned it. Good job! Anyway, Rambo lands safely in Vietnam and meets up with his Vietnamese counterpart, Ko, played by Julia Nixon. How come you're so late? Got hung up. Really? We've gone from post-traumatic stress to Schwarzenegger one-liners? And I'm kind of torn on the Ko character. On the one hand, it is kind of awesome that they gave Rambo a female partner who is a very capable soldier in her own right. On the other hand, this. I have a range boat to take us down river. Maybe go America. Live the quiet life. How can you get into this? What mean expendable? Ooh boy. Putting aside the obviously fake accent, I'm just gonna say it, this is racist. I can understand someone who did not grow up in an English-speaking country not speaking English perfectly. Learning a foreign language is hard, especially English from what I hear. So Ko not speaking perfect English makes total sense. But the way they portray her broken English is just lazy. There's no pattern or consistency to it at all. All they do is take correct English sentences and drop or change words at random. Sometimes she uses articles. Sometimes she doesn't. Sometimes she uses prepositions. Sometimes she doesn't. Sometimes she uses the correct verb tense. Sometimes you get the idea. Try getting across to Thailand? Yeah. Then go America? Then go to America. You just used the preposition to in literally the previous fucking sentence, so I know you know how it works. But I thought you were supposed to need to take pictures. Oh my god, a complete sentence. Where did that come from? Like I said, no consistency. So that's Ko. In some ways, progressive for the 1980s. In others, sadly reflective of the 1980s. Getting back to the story, Rambo and Ko hire some pirates to take them down the river toward what they suspect is a POW camp. And on the way, Rambo talks about his initial return home from Vietnam and how he traded one war for another. Kind of like a quiet war. War against uh, all the soldiers returning. It's the kind of war you don't win. Ah, uh, yes. The war against all the soldiers who returned home from Vietnam. Rambo alluded to this in his big speech at the end of First Blood, as I recall. Did I see all those maggots at the airport? Protesting me, spitting, 
Call me baby killer and all kinds of vile crap? Well, I can imagine that coming home to something like that would put one hell of a sour taste in your mouth, but here's the thing. This idea that people were protesting the soldiers is largely a myth, and there is no evidence to back it up. As Vietnam veteran Jerry Lemke points out in his book, The Spinning Image, this idea was mainly pushed by the Nixon administration as a way of deflecting blame for the failed Vietnam War away from the government's shitty leadership and onto the protesters, as if by protesting the war you're also somehow protesting the troops. Ridiculous. On the contrary, the relationship between the protesters and returning soldiers was overwhelmingly positive, and a good number of protesters were veterans themselves. They wanted the government to stop the war and bring the boys home. Now, why would they want to bring the boys home just to spin on them? It doesn't pass the smell test, does it? And if anyone was called a baby killer, it was President Johnson. Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? And as Chicago Tribune columnist Bob Green pointed out, hippies were not exactly the most macho types. And can you honestly picture a hippie coming face to face with a green beret just returned home from Vietnam and thinking, you know what? I'm gonna spit on him. And even if that hippie was somehow high enough to think this was a good idea, can you then imagine the Green Beret, a highly trained killing machine who, if ordered, would eat his own guts and then ask for seconds, just standing there and taking it? If there was a trend of people spitting on returning troops, there would also be a trend of returning troops putting people in the hospital. Now, of course, as Lemke admits, we cannot prove a negative. And it is entirely possible that some protester spit on some soldier somewhere at some time. But if such incidents occurred, they were incredibly rare and completely contrary to what the anti-war movement stood for. You didn't think you were going to get a history lesson today, did you? I'm not apologizing. It's a shame this bit was included in First Blood, as it's a black mark on an otherwise amazing speech and an otherwise excellent film. And it's equally shameful to continue this myth in the sequel. Veterans have had to endure all manner of challenges and sacrifices during deployment and when rotating back to the world, and we don't need to resort to making shit up to convey that. Anyway, Rambo and co. ultimately find the POW camp, but Rambo is abandoned by Murdoch and his mercenaries as they apparently never intended to rescue the POWs in the first place. They were hoping Rambo would find nothing and thus Congress could put the issue to bed, and if he did find something, sweep it under the rug. Troutman voices his displeasure, of course, but Murdoch isn't having it. I'm giving you a direct order to withdraw from this project. In what universe would a major even think about giving orders to a colonel? I know he's the villain, but come on. Do I get the rescue team or do I go over your head? You're a goddamn colonel. You already are over his head. So Rambo is captured and tortured by some Russians. Oh, yeah, there are Russians in this movie now. Because of course there are. But Ko comes to his rescue and they both escape. You look like hell, Rambo. So does this shot. My god. This is true of a lot of shots in this movie. They look hazy, like there's a film covering the camera lens or something. I never saw the movie during its original theatrical run, so at first I wondered if it might just be a problem with the Blu-ray transfer. But according to Blu-ray.com, the 4K version has the same issue, and that was made using a 4K scan of the original negative. So I suppose this is how the film originally looked in 1985. And therefore I must ask, how did this happen? Was this just an unavoidable side effect of filming in this location? Or did they actually think it looked good? The cinematographer was Jack Cardiff, who had an Oscar under his belt, so it seems unlikely he wouldn't know what he was doing. But even Oscar winners aren't perfect. Anyway, after that hazy mess of a shot, Ko asks Rambo to take her to America, and... Wait, what? 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 Where the hell did this come from? When was there even the slightest hint of romantic chemistry between these two? If there was, I sure as hell didn't see it. I think you made good choice. I think you're gonna get fridged, because I see no other reason for this romance. <laughs> but I didn't think it was gonna happen right away. And she dies while shedding a tear. Laying it on a bit thick, are we? But not as thick as it was apparently supposed to be. In the original cut, after Ko dies, Rambo actually looks to the sky and screams, No! But during a test screening, the audience howled with laughter, as you might expect, so they cut it. It's too bad Star Wars didn't get that memo.
And finally, an hour into the movie, we can finally get to the big Rambo killing spree. This is what would define the character for years to come. And I'm not gonna lie, it is kind of awesome. All those silly, over-the-top action movie tropes we've come to know and love were born or at least popularized here. Gearing up montage? Check. High kill count? Check. Narrowly jumping away from an explosion? Check. Machine gun shells hitting the floor? Check. Screaming for no reason? Ah! Check. Standing there and taking careful aim while getting shot at? <laughs> Check. It's stupid as hell, but it's the most enjoyable kind of stupid. And there's a reason why so many others have copied or parodied this style over the years. My personal favorite, which I'm sure will surprise no one, is UHF. Ah! I do wish it didn't take the movie an hour to get to the fun stuff, but at least we got there. And Rambo rescues every single POW because he's a one-man army who leaves no man behind. And as he arrives back at the base, he... leaves every man behind as he grabs the M60 off the chopper and wanders off. You're not going to stick around and make sure that all those POWs that you just put so much effort into rescuing are okay and taken care of? No? Okay, you do you. And Rambo decides the best course of action is to shoot all of the expensive equipment. Okay, then. I hate technology for reasons that were never clarified! And after threatening to come find Murdoch if he doesn't find the rest of the POWs in Vietnam, and giving another speech that isn't nearly as powerful as the one he gave at the end of Part 1, Rambo just leaves. And then we hear Sly's brother Frank singing the song Peace in Our Life over the credits, which rings incredibly hollow given what we just witnessed. And that's Rambo First Blood Part 2. And boy is that title a mouthful. Couldn't they have just called it Rambo or First Blood 2 or Second Blood? I don't know. Something simpler than Rambo First Blood Part 2. It doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. But anyway, the movie is pretty bad. It took the premise of his predecessor and everything it stood for and just threw it away. Except for the bit about people protesting the returning soldiers. So the one thing they kept from First Blood was the one thing it got wrong. Good job, guys. In the end, Rambo First Blood Part 2 is just another big dumb action movie. But I will admit it morphs into an enjoyable sort of bad in the third act when it goes completely bonkers and Rambo just starts flipping out and killing people. It's ridiculous and over the top in all the best ways. The film was nominated for seven Razzies and took home four. Worst original song, well deserved. Worst screenplay, ditto. Worst actor for Sylvester Stallone, which I'm not sure I agree with, to be honest. And worst picture, of course. And I'm not sure I agree with that either. Now, admittedly, I have not seen all of the worst picture nominees from that year. But I'll tell you what I have seen. A little thing called Red Sonja. I would argue Red Sonja was far more deserving of worst picture than Rambo First Blood Part 2. And Red Sonja wasn't even nominated. But what else should I expect? The same people who didn't nominate Red Sonja for Worst Picture did nominate Talia Shire for Worst Supporting Actress for her role in Rocky IV. And for that, they can go fuck themselves. Rocky IV, which was also nominated for Worst Picture, is a very silly, jingoistic movie. Kind of like First Blood Part II. I like it anyway, but many people don't, and that's fine. I get it. But there was not a goddamn thing wrong with Shire's acting, and to suggest otherwise is objectively wrong. And this is something that the people at the Golden Raspberry Foundation have a tendency to forget. A movie can be bad overall, and still have individual parts that are good. The inverse is also true. If you're going to watch Rambo First Blood Part 2, I would almost recommend skipping to the last half hour. That's where all the fun stuff is. And by skipping the first hour, you're not missing a whole lot. Well, that's another worst picture in the can. Next time, we move on to 1986, which means... What does that mean? Hang on a second. Let's see. Seventh Golden Raspberry Awards. And the worst picture is... Oh... Fuck me. It's a tie?
not expendable. <laughs>